Our topic this week is a famous cautionary tale on economics, and that is the Phillips curve. Uh, the corresponding chapter is Plum Chart Chapter 8. You should have had some exposure to this topic in principles. Um, so you certainly had if you had me. If not, we'll clarify what it is uh, in this simple introduction. Now, the Phillips curve, named after A.W. Phillips, who was a New Zealand-born British economist who taught at the London School of Economics, is an empirically observed relationship between unemployment and inflation, first established in the United Kingdom from about the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. The general idea is that the inflation rate in this period was generally low when unemployment rate was high, and the inflation was generally high when the unemployment rate was low. Phillips then later replicated his observation for the United States. He didn't have a lot of data. He only had 12 observations for the original specification. That was later extended to about 1900 to 1960. And lo and behold, from that period on, uh, in, during that period in the United States, the relationship was inwards as well. At the same time, the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model had become very popular. It became common policy wisdom after World War I. And there was a general theoretical thought that came out of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model that underpinned, that sort of suggested a causal relationship between inflation and unemployment as suggested by the Phillips curve. And this is something you already know, even if it's not perfectly aware, uh, if it's not perfectly clear to you at this point. It has simply to do with monetary policy. Um, you already know that monetary policy in the short run can stimulate demand. If we increase the money supply, we can lower interest rates. That stimulates investment demand, pushing the aggregate demand curve out. That in turn causes some inflation. Prices will increase. As inflation increases in the short run, it carries over to even more inflation in the medium run because nominal wages will eventually adjust. And that pushes inflation. So the inflation rate, in many ways, is a policy variable. The conduct of monetary policy determines to a degree what the inflation is going to be. Now, based on Phillips' observation, this suggested a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. We could, for instance, keep the inflation rate higher, i.e. print more money, which should result in a lower unemployment rate. Or we could keep inflation lower, which would result in higher unemployment. And up until the 1970s, this was a, an ongoing policy discussion in the United States where the thought was, well, what do we want? Do we inflation, do we unemployment? Do we want unemployment? Is there a trade-off between the two? Now, in the 1970s, the relationship as observed by the Phillips curve fell apart. The relationship was no longer there. And this is an important caveat that past economic data, historical economic data, is often not a good predictor for what's going to happen to economic relationships in the future. And this is something known as the Lucas critique, and we'll talk a little bit more about Robert Lucas later on. The reason for this is that while we're social scientists, this data is not experimentally generated data, and it is data that is behavioral. So unlike a black hole that will always behave the same way when two different people look at it, human behavior can change. And often it changes depending on policy implemented based on past observed behavior. And so as we're changing policies, as we're changing monetary policy, the relationship between, say, unemployment and wages can change over time. That's the important caveat here. There's still modifications of the Phillips curve that float around. There is a certain logic to it, although it's empirically not quite stable, and we talk about alternative modified versions of the Phillips curve as we go along. First things first, the original Phillips curve, if you look at the paper that Phillips published, which is right here, I'll post a link in the, on the website. Um, what you'll find is that from about 1861 to 1913, in any given year where the unemployment rate in Britain was low, inflation rates were relatively high. In any given year where the unemployment rate was high, inflation rates were either low or they were potentially even negative. Now, Phillips didn't have inflation the way we understand it today. What he had was nominal wage data. But nominal wage data is closely related to, say, consumer price inflation. Now, what's the theory? Sort of a primer here. Why may low unemployment imply inflation? As I mentioned initially, this comes out of the aggregate supply aggregate demand model. Specifically, it comes out of the AS relationship. Note that firms increase prices whenever there's an increase in real wages. And real wages increase when the unemployment rate is low. That's the reason to believe why there might be a causal relationship. If the unemployment rate is increasing, prices should 
fall, less bargaining power for workers. If the unemployment rate is decreasing, more bargaining power for workers, prices will increase. Second prices also depend on expected prices, and that has to do with the fact that we don't bargain for real wages, we bargain for nominal wages, which forces us to form an expectation of what price is going to be. If we all think that prices will be higher, we will ask for a higher nominal wage, and then one by one translates into higher production costs and higher prices charged by firms. Now, there's a bit of algebra here, most of which I'm going to skip. But to make this argument a little bit more tractable, we're going to assume the relationship between real wages and unemployment is linear. Specifically, we're going to assume that it's equal to 1 minus alpha times u plus c. Linear specifications have their problems. Specifically, the unemployment rate could easily become negative. But in this context, this served the simplicity of the argument. Now, with a lot of algebra, substituting 2 into 1 and expressing everything as a rate of change, basically as a percentage change, we can express this relationship as an inflation specification. Um, I'm not going to do this here because unless you're interested in economics, unless you're interested in sort of the math of, of time, of rates of change, um, it's a lot of tedium involved. It's not something you can do quickly, but I will post this as an appendix on the website at a later point this week. Specifically, what the aggregate supply curve is suggesting now, the intuition, and that's important, is that inflation rates are equal to expected inflation plus mu, markup mu, plus z, our catch-all variable, minus alpha times u. When we think of changes over time, and inflation is such a change over time, we normally add on time index t to the variables that change over time, to illustrate dynamics. When economists talk about dynamics behavior, dynamic behavior or dynamics in general, they really just talk about changes over time. What does T stand for? Any generic time period. It could be March 2020, it could be the year 1978, whatever you currently observe it. For instance, here, the aggregate supply curve suggests that inflation in period T is equal to expected inflation in period T plus mu and z minus alpha times unemployment in period T. And notice that we do not index mu and z and alpha here because we're for now simply assuming that the time invariant. They're not as critical for studying the Phillips curve. You can play around a little bit with what happens when you change them. But for our purposes, we'll focus on changes in the other three. Specifically, how is inflation responding to expected inflation and changes in the unemployment rate. And the simple specification, we condense a complicated subject like inflation into four simple things. Expected inflation, markup indicating from competitive, labor market frictions captured by the variable z, and the unemployment rate. Inflation increases one by one when expected inflation increases. This should be intuitive. For instance, if you think that the inflation rate next year is going to be 2%, you should ask for a 2% higher normal wage. This will drive up from production costs by 2%, and therefore will cause inflation of 2%. If you think it's 3%, you should ask for a 3% wage increase and so forth. Mark Abel, only touch on very quickly. The general idea here is that if the markup that firms charge increases, the firms become less competitive. This causes inflation. Again, this should be intuitive. It simply means that for any particular cost change, firms will add more to prices. Similarly, labor market frictions tend to increase inflation because they drive up real wages faster. For our purposes, importantly, we assume that an increase in the unemployment rate reduces inflation. Again, this has to do with bargaining power. Higher unemployment rate means you can ask for a smaller real wage. That means real wages increase slower over time. For the same token, if the unemployment rate declines, real wages tend to accelerate. That causes more inflation. Unlike expected inflation, we do not make the assumption that this relationship is one by one. Instead, this coefficient alpha indicates the relation strength. So for instance, if alpha is 0.5, an increase in the unemployment rate by 1% would lead to a reduction in inflation by half a percent. As mentioned earlier, and I will end on this, the focus on the relationship between unemployment inflation and actual inflation allows us to ignore mu and z. We're really not that interested here. We keep them around because the result from the aggregate supply could get demand model. If you had a more complicated production function, other stuff would go in here. But critically for the Phillips curve, we care about unemployment, inflation expectations, and actual inflation.